Hi, I've been asked to talk today about some problems we have when trying to represent historical data, in my case, in the 11th century Near East, in the digital realm, and about an idea that my team and I will be pursuing in our ERC Project Relevant, which is scheduled to run until 2026. If we want to have a network of open data about the Middle Ages, after all, it's important to have the sort of data that medieval historians want to trust and use. So we hear that the 11th century was a time of limited travel and even more limited knowledge about others. Or was it a time of unprecedented mobility? This is another view we hear. They're a bit different. A particularly sharp example comes when looking at two publications by two well-respected scholars, both published within the last 20 years, one from a Western medieval background and one from broadly speaking Byzantine studies. On the one hand, we have Thomas Asbridge saying that here, which means Northeastern France in the mid 11th century, as in the rest of Europe, even nobles could expect to live their entire lives without traveling more than hundred kilometers from home. But then Jonathan Shepard is talking about the exact same time frame, and he's talking about the quickening of long distance trading and written communications in the course of this 11th century. Uh, more frequent face to face encounters of Westerns with Easterners and Muslims, and also Scandinavia and Rus with, with pagans. And so this is quite a discrepancy. And you could say it might arise from a disproportionate focus in the modern Western world, especially on events within Western Europe at the time. And this is understandable from the perspective of our search for the roots of the crusading mov movement, which was so significant to European history, especially, and you know, our own culture. But from outside the Western perspective, this can sometimes appear a bit parochial. After all, the heartlands of the crusading movement were not yet anywhere near the center of gravity of the Christian world. Consider the East, you had Byzantium, you had Syria, you had the Caucasus. Consider the North, you had these comparatively vast territories undergoing a fairly recent process of Christianization, Rus, Hungary, um, much of Central Europe that way. Consider even the Holy Land, which was not under Christian rule, but was nevertheless a focal point of devotion and pilgrimage from all over Christendom and had plenty of Christians living there for sure. So one of the motivating questions of this talk, and in fact the project, is how do we integrate such complex and differently perceived pictures of the reality of the 11th century Christian world? Now, on the one hand, the integration of all of these different regional pictures needs all the help it can get. And what we we're talking when we we're talking about vast volumes of small pieces of information that don't obviously cohere, computers and digital data would seem to be a very obvious means of approach. However, you know, there's a however coming. There are in fact quite a few different a few digital resources and an ever expanding amount of information that can be accessed online, but there's not so much in the way of integration. This is the however. Now it's tempting to see this merely as a technical problem. The semantic web is after all about the linking together of lots of different sorts of information. And there's been quite a bit of work on vocabulary, standards, ontologies, linked open data repositories and so on to try to get all of these pieces of information connected with each other. But a closer look at how these resources are used or well, not used suggests that the problem is not just a technical one but more of a fundamental one. And I think the root of the problem lies in the fact that the semantic web was conceived in the modern day for cases where the facts are both unambiguous and available. For example, the dentist's opening hours are 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. My calendar has these six meetings this week. Find me a time to go to the dentist. And this assumption of unambiguous and available facts breaks down massively when we try to record things about history. So this, Uncertainty is the basic problem we have. For all of these collections of facts and statements in digital repositories, how do we know which ones we can trust? This is a large part of why we are always cautioned away from using Wikipedia for our term papers, after all. And uncertainty is certainly a problem we have. One approach some people take is to try to quantify the uncertainty or to do the opposite, quantify the likelihood that a statement is true. For example, here that the skeleton is 70% likely to be male. But I'd argue, first of all, that uncertainty is pretty hard to quantify in most cases. How do I arrive at, how do I decide that um, 
that something was 70% likely to have happened instead of 68% or 73% or 42%. I don't know. And for that matter, maybe quantification isn't the whole of the thing. Historians making claims about their field tend to be feel pretty certain that what they're saying is, you know, 95, 100% true, even when they disagree, even when the other historian is saying, oh, that's ridiculous, that's only 5 or 10% true. Then what do we do? So just because something is, you know, something is stated as fact doesn't mean it's contested. We see that for sure. But what we want to do is leave open the possibility, which is important for times and places like 11th century Christendom, to have things that everybody right now thinks is true, but we might need to come back and contest something after all. And so we need to build this ability to handle conflict right in the system. And this brings me to our project, which proposes to deal with the question of how we robustly express conflicting information in our historical sources and our present day reconstructions, and even how we can use digital methods to express the multi-perspectivity that is so sought after in current historical method. One of the things I want to do is show that digital humanities doesn't have to mean positivist humanities. And we're concentrating for this on the 11th century Christian world, which had very many perspectives and very contested events of which only one or two narratives generally get any airtime in the popular consciousness. So this is a list of who we are. We're based at the University of Vienna mostly and partially at the Austrian Center for Digital Humanities and Cultural Heritage of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Um, at the Uni Vienna, we have, besides me, we have our postdocs, Katalin Prada and Martin Rosa, and our pre-docs, Alexander Angelovich and Louis Reed. And then we have our team at the Academy, who are Carla Abel, Stefan Probst, and Nina Richards. And last but certainly not least, we have our admin and outreach person who keeps us all organized, who is Marin Dyer. And you can visit us at our website shown here on the slide. So at the heart of our digital work is this thing called the assertion model which we are going to use for data collection throughout the project. Well, going to, we are using for data collection throughout the project. We call this the STAR model for structured assertion record. Here we are trying to approach the problem that on the one hand, linked open data is a popular model for collections of information about, well, pretty much everything, including cultural heritage, museum data, that kind of thing. On the other hand, linked open data was designed as we were talking about without controversy in mind for the most part, and so we, what happens is that these bits of information tend to get dissociated very quickly from the context in which they should be regarded. You just have this ba basic fact, you know, this thing happened at this time, the end, that's it. And so here's a brief sketch of our model. First, we start with a typical linked open data model. We have exactly just a statement. In this case, the statements are always a subject, a predicate, and an object. And in this case, we're saying that Hervé Frangopoulos, our subject, um, the predicate, the thing, the relation between the subject and the object in this case is the death of Frangopoulos. So, you know, he died. You usually think of a predicate as a kind of verb. And the object in this case is a bit of data, which is the year 1063, 1064 or so, which corresponds to the year 512 of the Armenian era. And so this is basically what linked open data tends to look like. The subject and object are connected with some kind of relationship, which is a predicate, usually something like a verb. But we have some problems. Who says this is true? And why are they saying it's true? Why should we actually just take this statement at face value? I mean, what are we? Aren't we historians? Well, so we're missing provenance and we're missing authority. And this is what the star model tries to add back in. It means that the predicate, the relationship bit is itself no longer just a relationship, but it's a thing of its own that can have its own properties. So for example, you know, the, the predicate there was died and maybe we can say something about, about the mode of dying or something like that. Or maybe we can say that, well, this source says he died, but this other source says that he was only wounded. It was a flesh wound. So, this is a pretty simple example, um, basically the same case, but expressed more properly inside our CRM. So the statement together with the authority and the provenance constitutes an assertion. 
And here we're expressing a CIDOC CRM statement, but we're tying it to who said it and where it is said or derived from. And so in this case, we have the 12th century historian, Matthew Videssa telling us through the chronicle that is attributed to him about this guy, Frangopoulos, and that he died allegedly at the hands of the Byzantine emperor who was his employer in 1063 or 1064. Here's a more elaborated version of the event where we're really using the Sadoc CRM model to say when the death happened. So it's a little bit more complicated than I showed in the first slide. You have to first say that the death was the death was a thing, it's an event that happened to a person. And then you have to say when it happened in these two different assertions. But here's a conflicting assertion based on a different source. So the present day historian Werner Seibt found a seal which made it pretty clear that this Frangopoulos was still alive and assuming or at least trying to assume command of the Eastern armies after the Battle of Manzikert in 1071. So like in the, you know, it's up to the user to decide what to trust here. But here, what we want to do is provide information about the authorities, you know, who's saying this and why and the sources so that people can decide based on these things, which of these statements they trust. And one of the first obvious questions we wanted to answer for ourselves was how, if at all, does this fit into existing models? In fact, the problem of conflicting assertions has been getting an increasing amount of work in the last couple of years. There's been a relevant re revision to the CIDOC CRM standard published in 2019 and an extension proposing an argumentation model that was published in a preliminary form in 2015. So we've been working on this model for about a year and here you can see some of the ontologies we've adopted. We have CIDOC CRM for the information that it covers, though this is by no means complete. It's mostly good at talking about things and a little bit sketchier at talking about people and their relationships. Um, we use Ferber OO to model the source material more effectively using some of the um, side schemes to talk about the material bits of the source material. And we use other ontologies as in, you know, basically we can, we try to incorporate other ontologies as used in existing data scores into our assertion model so that we can point back in things and say, this is who's saying this thing and why. And once we have these assertions, so our next step is to collect them into viewpoints. This helps us to answer questions like, what does Matthew think happened on the basis of this chronicle? Which things is Matthew, which bits of information does Matthew accept or you know, by extension possibly reject? What does Vernon Seif seem to think happened on the basis of his published papers? What for that matter do I think happened when I start going through this data and looking at it and trying to decide what my own idea of reconstruction is? So we come back to our example. Matthew has made this assertion about Frangopoulos dying, which I've reduced a bit. And he's made a bunch of other assertions besides having to do with other bits of the career of Frangopoulos, let's say. This is kind of a schematic, but you see the idea. Matthew says a bunch of things. Now, it's then pretty trivial for us to say that the chronicle attributed to Matthew represents his viewpoint or his understanding of what happens. But now Werner Seibt comes along and he's made this other assertion based on the seal that Frangopoulos's death date was different than what Matthew says. And so we can kind of model what Seibt thinks about what happened as, you know, he accepts, he accepts his own assertion. He accepts a couple of Matthew's assertions, but not all of them. And so we can start to see where different people overlap in their understanding of what happened and where they don't. And this actually brings me to another fun question, which is that of authority, which turns out not to be all that straightforward. Here are a few examples of some authority or responsibility statements, like Matthew Videssa writes that the emperor had Frangopoulos executed in 1063. Dedeyan, another modern author, concludes from the text of Matthew's Chronicle that Frangopoulos was executed in 1063. He takes this and believes it. Zeibt understands Matthew's Chronicle to contain the information that Frangopoulos was executed in 1063, but Zeibt doesn't think that that was actually the case. He doesn't think Matthew was right. Or, you know, Andrews understands Matthew's Chronicle to this, I'm making this up, I don't necessarily believe this, but it's fun to say that I do for the illustration purposes. Andrews understands Matthew's Chronicle to contain the information that Frangopoulos was executed, oh, probably sometime between 1072 and 1078, that Matthew was just wrong about the dating. These are all different statements. So that's kind of fun. 
So these are some of the questions we've wrestled with, you know, for can the medieval author of a text be an authority in the database? We're lately con concluding, yes, they can, because, you know, they're the ones who this information comes from. They were human shaping, shaping the narrative. Or, you know, for secondary sources, if a scholar today refers to a primary source to make a claim, do we have to attach that scholar's name to the claim as well because the scholar interpreted the primary source to say that? And then if we do, do we have to do this for all scholars who ever accepted any fact anywhere? That could get a little bit overwhelming. So this one we're not doing so much, but we, we bring in the secondary sources when they're saying things that aren't exactly represented in primary sources, let's say. And we can, you know, if, if it matters for expressing a modern scholar's argument, then we can, you know, make a viewpoint where they are taking in some of these other authorities into their viewpoint. And we have fun things like, you know, where's the line between just reading what the text says, quote unquote, and interpreting what the text means, as Zeibt has clearly done with the seal showing that Frangopoulos was alive in 1071. And then we have this lovely thing about common knowledge, like on whose authority exactly do we have it that Irene Dukaina was female? I mean, nobody actually, nobody in the primary source has actually said, you know, this was a female person, but everybody kind of assumes it. So do we need an authority statement for this? How do we model that sort of thing? These are the, these are the questions that, you know, we have to get answered in our model. So how do we do the source modeling then? Uh, we've talked about problems we have to solve in the authority modeling. So how about the source modeling? Well, material items are quite easy to represent in Sidoc CRM. That's kind of the whole thing. If there's something that could appear in a museum, then Sidoc has you covered. Um, textual sources, we had some early experiments with BibFrame, but later we realized that we don't need BibFrame. I need to update the slide. Um, we don't need BibFrame because between Ferber OO, which is the much more common um, bibliographical ontology, and Sidoc CRM to handle the material aspects, we can get what we need from the sources and it actually works a little bit better from us. So pretend that that textual source has just talked about Ferber OO instead of BibFrame. And so what do we do now? We have, when it's a matter of an inscription appearing on an object or a sentence appearing in a manuscript, you know, as I say, Sadoc CRM takes care of this for us already. And for textual sources, it's not so different. What we end up doing is that we have, this is an example of um, a dignity conferred upon a person, which we can tell because they had a lead seal made with the inscription saying who they were and with that dignity. Um, we can say that the, you know, the source is the inscription and the inscription comes from this, um, you know, the inscription is part of this seal and both of these things we know from the person who cataloged it, which was, you know, the source for the cataloging was of course the, the printed catalog. When it comes for database evidence, we have a little bit more tricky stuff to do because we can't exactly say that we went through and reread all these sources and remade all these statements because that would, you know, it's not very fair to the people who did a bunch of data collecting in another, pro in another project, such as the prosopography of Byzantine world. This is what PBW stands for. If they did all of this data collecting and we go and suck it all into our database and pretend we did all the data collecting, that's not really fair, is it? So we have to be a little bit more careful for database evidence. And this is something like our current solution. We, um, in this case, we're talking about the fact that Skilitsis, the, the medieval historian mentions that Frangopoulos had a house at a place called Dagarabe. And in this case, our authority is Skilitsis because we decided that medieval people can be authorities, but our source is actually a PBW of Byzantine prosopography factoid, which is in a database somewhere else. And so we can make a same as um, link and link to their own hosted factoid, which is in this factoid prosopography ontology or will be soon. And we can also say that this um, factoid is a derivative of the actual source that we got it with. SH st here stands for Synopsis Historicon, which is the thing that Skilitsis wrote. And so here we can express both that this stuff comes from Skilitsis and also 
that we didn't take it directly from Skelitzes, but we link, we got it from this database that we're linking to here so that people can follow the links and see where that information came from originally. And so what are we going to do in the future? A lot of this has been about people stuff because we have been concentrating quite strongly on person information in the first year of the project. But next up is place. And over the next year, we're really going to be concentrating a lot on the place strand of the project. Um, and we we're sort of sorting out right now in the, in the last few weeks, what questions we actually want to ask about place, what vocabularies we can use to, to serve to answer these questions and um, what kind of mapping interfaces we're going to want in order to, in order to say anything, to say the things we want to say about the place, the space in which people moved during this time. And then for the third strand text, we're also brainstorming about that. You know, what do we want to understand about texts and their circulation? To what extent do we care about the content of the text? And to what extent do we care about the physical objects of the text? I mean, the answer is that we care deeply about both, but how do we, how do, we do this together? So this is what's coming up in the future in the project. And I thank you for listening to this video and I encourage you to keep abreast of our developments.